right. We thank the Lord this morning. Thank God for this worship band. Uh, we are just so grateful, aren't we, uh, for the, their uh, ministry here. And thank God for all of you. If you're visiting here for the first time, you're a guest. Uh, I'm the associate minister, so whatever mistakes I make today or whatever happens, just know next week our senior minister, Greg Warren, plans to be back. He'll clean up after me. He's starting a new series on generosity, so we're really looking forward to that, aren't we? We miss him today, but look forward to him being back with us for next week. Also, just want to let you know that um, how, how grateful to God we are for your service in the kingdom of God. And we make mistakes. We fail, don't we? I know I make a lot of mistakes. And I don't know if any of you, you probably do, you have like that maybe one or two most embarrassing moments in life where you're just really embarrassed of what happened. You try to forget it, but it's hard to forget, isn't it? Some years ago, uh, Deborah wanted me to take her to a, a women's meeting over at a church in Lexington. And she said, John, just take me over there, drop me off. It's like from 9 to 3 or something. And uh, she said, if you could just come pick me up then around 3 o'clock. So when I drove up to the church at 3 o'clock, I looked around and didn't see anybody, just a bunch of cars. I thought, I better go in and check and make sure this, I got the time right and everything. I walked in and there was a lady there uh, to greet me. So I greeted her, but the next thing I knew, there was another lady next to her. And then there was another lady and another lady. I didn't want to offend any of them. I felt really awkward, and I'm sure they felt really awkward with me being at a women's meeting, of course. Uh, so I just kept greeting these ladies, and there was like a line of them. So I just kept saying hi, introducing myself, felt very awkward. But the next thing I knew, I was in front of a sink and a mirror. And I looked over, and there was a lady next to me, and she's like, excuse me, sir, you are in the ladies' bathroom. And I'm like, oh, no. So I just try to stay away from uh, women's conferences and ladies' meetings, okay? Stick with a men's uh, group. But we're uh, really looking forward to uh, just, I am diving into God's Word, just sharing a few scriptures uh, with you this, this morning. But before we do that, let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer, okay? God, we, we just really come humbly before you, Father. Uh, God, you are so incredibly great, so incredibly awesome. God, I feel so inadequate to be up here. But Lord, we're just so thankful for your Holy Spirit. And we just pray, God, that you would take, take over. Thank you for the great worship and everyone who has a part in this service and everyone here today, whether uh, they're here in person uh, watching online, God. We even have somebody in another, another country said they're, they're watching online today. Uh, Father, those listening by radio, whatever it is, we pray, God, that they would know your love, your power, God, and your help. So, God, if you would just move powerfully in each one of our minds today and each one of our hearts, and God, as we've already prayed, if there's Someone here today who does not know Jesus Christ is their Savior and Lord. I pray today, God, that they would make that most important decision to follow Jesus. And then, God, we just, I, I pray right now that the, the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart, they would be pleasing in your sight, O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. We pray it all in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. amen. I have these uh, three chairs up here today, and I've seen like a lot of illustrations and sermons on different chairs. Uh, some use one, three, four, five, however uh, you want to communicate the uh, point that you're trying to make. I think Brother Greg used four here a while back, but I'm using three today because of the scriptures that I'll be sharing here, and I just want to illustrate the point with you. So hopefully that'll be helpful. Sometimes I know I need a picture in my mind of how to live for God, and maybe this will uh, be helpful to you. But if you'll turn with me in your Bibles to Joshua chapter 24, I want to begin with one verse, just reading some of it out of verse 15, that's very familiar to us. A lot of us have the plaque or have it on our wall in our home. I know Deborah and I have this on our wall uh, because it inspires us. But it's Joshua talking here in verse 15, and he says, Choose today whom you will serve. And then he goes on to say, But as for me and my family, or me and my house, we will serve the Lord. 
So we see that verse that we know well. And then if you'll go on to verse 31 of that same chapter, Joshua says, the people of Israel served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and the elders who outlived him, those who had personally experienced all that the Lord had done for Israel. And then I want to share one other uh, passage at this point. And it goes on, it's in uh, Judges uh, chapter 2, verse 10. It says, after the gen that generation died, uh, catch this, another generation grew up who did not acknowledge the Lord or remember the mighty things he had done for Israel. You see, as we read those verses, and I've been meditating, praying on those verses, it breaks my heart because I'm so fired up and inspired when you see Joshua saying, man, it's for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. He doesn't take this, you know, vote or poll. He just says, hey, this is what we're doing. And then everyone else, as we know the story, they go on and say, yeah, Joshua, we're going to serve God with you. If you've never read that in the Bible, please go home and read that today because that is so powerful. But I look at Joshua as I have these chairs up here, is in chair number one. He is full of commitment. He is fully committed to the Lord. We say Christ today, don't we, God? He says, it's for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. He is in chair number one. He surrendered to the Lord. He is uh, serving Christ, and he's just, his heart is for God. Doesn't mean he's perfect. Doesn't mean he's not flawed, but his heart, his ambition is a chair number one, is to serve God. But as we go on and read, it says that the elders, doesn't it? As you see in verse 31, it says those who were after the people of Israel served the Lord throughout their lifetime of Joshua and of the elders who outlived him, those who had personally experienced all that the Lord had done for Israel. So chair two, we see that they experienced a lot of what chair one did, but they weren't fully as, as fully committed to God as chair one. There was compromise. They were riding the fence spiritually. They were living a double standard life. Uh, you probably know it well. I know it well. When I first became a, a Christ follower, this is where I was, chair two. I thought I could keep one foot in the world and one foot in Christ. And it wasn't working. I was the most miserable guy for like one year of my life until I said, okay, God, I give up. What, what is it? And I fully surrendered myself to God. And then I was able to receive peace and strength from the Holy Spirit. I still had a lot of troubles and problems. That doesn't mean that they leave us. But I remember chair two so well. But look at chair number Three. Let's read that again in Joshua or in Judges chapter 2, verse 10. It says, after that generation died, another generation grew up, chair 3, uh, who did not acknowledge the Lord or remember the mighty things he had done for Israel. You see, this chair, number 3, is, is conflict. It's, it's misunderstanding Christianity. It's rebelliousness toward God because the example that's been set before them is kind of one foot in the world and one foot in God. And so they're like, I don't want anything to do with that kind of Christianity. Uh, that's hypocritical. And I've been doing a lot of repenting, especially before this message, as God shows me areas of my life that he wants me to get stronger in and grow closer to him. And I hope you do the same as well, because God doesn't want any hypocrisy in our lives, but he's got to help me with that. He's got to help you with that. You see, this generation here leaned a lot on chapter, on uh, this first generation, uh, chair one, for all of their insight and kind of just riding, as they say, the coattails of uh, maybe you've done that with your parents or grandparents. You try to just have their faith in the Lord instead of owning it for yourself. And because it was like this, there was a gap, the baton was dropped, and this chair, this generation never got what the first generation had. You see, this chair one is so awesome 
It doesn't mean the person's perfect, but they're living for God. You just see it, don't you? Those people are like transparent. You want to be around them. You know that they're salt and light. Uh, when I was in high school, my senior year, I, I've told you all a lot that I didn't grow up in church. We just maybe had gone at Christmas and Easter. I didn't know much about the Bible. I didn't know God's plan of salvation. Nobody was telling me there was like, I, I knew there's a heaven out there, but nobody was preaching to me, John, there's a heaven and there's a hell. You need to make the choice to live for God. They weren't doing that. I didn't have a Greg. I didn't have a Jacob. I didn't have a lot of you who are really sold out for God telling me that. So I was trying to figure this out. And so my senior year in high school, I watched a movie with my sister, Kim. It was called The Day After. And it was about if this world were to have a nuclear world uh, war, what would happen? And so as I was watching this movie, I thought to myself, oh no, if this happens, what am I going to do? And so I walked into my bedroom, grew up in Michigan, looked out into that Michigan, uh, that night sky there through my bedroom window. And I thought to myself, again, no preacher that I can remember, no gospel track I'm reading. I thought if I died tonight, I looked out that window, I thought, I will go to hell. I don't know why I thought that. Well, I believe it was the Holy Spirit of God showing me. So my next, the next day I walked into my public high school there in Michigan, and my first hour teacher was also my basketball coach, Mr. Taylor, Coach Taylor. Now, Coach Taylor was always real in the locker room. He would pray before the basketball games, and he said to us game after game before he prayed, he said, guys, it's my goal in this game not to get a technical foul. And then he would pray. And after the game, we'd go in the locker room, and if he got a technical, he said, guys, I blew it tonight. I was not a good example for you or for the people at the game. And so he was real. It's just like, wow. So I asked Mr. Taylor right before class started that morning, I said, Mr. Taylor, what would you do if we had a nuclear war? He said, come out in the hallway. So I was so humbled that he would take the time for me when he had this class to start. He said, John, he said, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. Now, this is in the public school, out in the hallway. He said, I believe that if we had a nuclear war, God would take care of me, and I'll be in heaven with him. He said, I, I'm just committed to God. And he, that's all he said. So let's go back into class. I could not stop thinking about the peace that this guy had, this coach. How could he have that peace that he would be with God if we had that kind of experience in our world? I started searching for God. I found a Bible, started reading this Bible, and it wasn't long after that that I surrendered my life to Jesus Christ, and I was baptized into Christ. I look back today as I'm reading these scriptures out of the Bible, and I think, God, how did you ever put such an incredible example in my path in Coach Taylor, a man who was, wasn't perfect but was trying hard to be in chair one, who was committed to Jesus Christ, and that he would take the time, God, to be, to spend with me, to talk to me about living for God. You see the impact, friends, of chair number one. When we get into this chair number two, it gets dangerous because people see that, well, they say they're a Christian, but they're not fully committed. And I've, that's what I've been repenting of, saying, God, please forgive me for the times where I've lived in so much compromise. And see, Joshua said, hey, we're serving God. We're gonna, we're, he just had clear focus, didn't he? He had clear focus and he was just so focused on God and saying, we're serving the Lord. We're living for God. If you all want to do that, that's great. But this is what we're doing. And how many of us know that that is exactly what our culture needs today? We need people who will stand up and say, count me in. I'm living fully for Jesus Christ. Isn't that what we need, church? Exactly. So as we see in the scriptures here, that compromise really can hurt, can do a lot of harm. When I grew up in my home, I saw that, and we didn't go to church. So as I became more surrendered to Christ, and God was calling me to preach, as I was doing that, uh, somebody told me, they said, John, when your family, when you sit down to eat, you need to pray for the food. And I was like, 
my family will think I'm a hypocrite. They watch me grow up, and now all of a sudden I'm going to pray at the table. But I remember it like yesterday, friends, that we were seated, seated, seated at the table. My um, dad was right here. My mom was there, and I was here. And we were seated there. And I remember night after night going to the table, feeling like a hypocrite, but I would bow my head and thank God for the food while everybody else was eating their meal. And they're probably thinking, man, who do you think? Who is this guy? Who does he think he is? But I just kept doing that. And one day, my, one uh, morning, my dad knocked on my bedroom door and said, John, you need to get me to the hospital. I said, Dad, I'll do it in a minute. He said, no, we need to go now. So uh, my mom, my dad, I drove them to the hospital. And my dad was seriously ill. And we thought he was getting better, but one night we received a call from the hospital. They said, you got to get up here. Your dad is very ill. I remember running into his hospital room. I'd only been a Christian like a year. I didn't really know how to pray, didn't know much about the Christian faith. But I remember running in there and asking God, God, please help my dad. Please save my dad. And the medical team was like, you got to get out of here. We're working with your dad. I said, that's my dad. I'm praying for him. So I went out and we waited and we waited. And then I remember going home, and I remember, remember there was a book called The Phone Book. It had the yellow pages in it. Some of you remember that? Well, I didn't know who to talk to about prayer, so I just started going through the yellow pages under C Church and looking at all these churches, and I would call those churches, and I would just ask them if they would pray for my dad. I said, my dad is seriously ill. Would you pray for him? And they said they would. So I just called every church, talked to every person I thought was a Christian, just said, please pray for my dad. Well, the day came where my dad came home from the hospital. God had worked powerfully in his life physically, but mainly spiritually. And we sat down. I remember we sat down at the dinner table, and he looked over at me, and he said, John, would you lead us in prayer before we eat? And I couldn't believe it. And I had that humble, that, that privilege. I was so humbled that I could pray for the meal. And then it wasn't long after that that my dad started praying for the meal. Sunday morning came around. I was used to driving to church on my own. My dad said, we're going to church together. You see, he was moving into this chair number one right before my very eyes. He was becoming more and more committed to Jesus Christ. So there I was right there in the family car, my dad driving, my mom up front, and I'm in the back, and my dad is leading our home now, and we're going to church. My dad all of a sudden tells me that he's reading the Bible through and that he's praying for people, and I got to see it, friends, and then our whole family started lining up because isn't that so true? We see often when the man uh, lives for God in the home, that everybody else follows through. And I just, I want to commend some of you are trying so hard for your family or you're, you're a single mother or you're somebody, a grandmother. You're trying to get your family to Christ. And I just, I want to let you know what an inspiration you are to me and to so many others because you're coming in and out of these doors week after week, listening to Brother Greg uh, share the gospel of Jesus Christ and you're trying to apply it to your life and live for God. You see, friends, God wants to take this middle chair out of our lives, this chair of compromise. He's like, just do away with it. Do away with it, because we've got to have committed people who are sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with this generation, the next generation, the next generation. And aren't we so grateful in this church that right now, in, down below us in the children's ministry, that Stacy and Michelle and their team are doing the very thing we're talking about. They're sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with the children. And they're going to be raised up in the Lord. And then they're going to pass that on and pass it on and pass it on. And the gospel of Jesus Christ will go on and on. But we got to make sure we're doing our part here, aren't we? Don't we? To make sure we're sharing Christ with these gen generations. See, God loves us. He loves the world. But as we can see in Scripture this morning, he wants all the generations. And I'm so thankful that we have a pastor, that we have an eldership 
that we have Stacy and Michelle and their team. We have Jacob and Lindsay. We've got all of these trying to reach children, students, adults. But the vision is here in this church to reach the generations. And we thank God for that this morning, don't we? We are a blood. Yeah, clap for God. <laughs> clap for the Lord. You see, I was, I was at an associate minister's gathering out of state one, uh, one year, a few years back. And there was a, a pastor talking. He was uh, sharing about his, sharing his testimony. And when he was up before us, he was talking about how his uh, dad and brother, his, his uncle, were, were taken to church by an elderly couple in the community. That they had asked the parents, his dad's parents, if they could take his dad and brother to church on Sunday morning because they weren't going to church. He said, my dad and brother went to church and they both received Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord. He said, but more so, my dad surrendered to the ministry and preached the gospel of Jesus Christ for countless years. So that's one generation right there. He said, today, he said, I'm pastoring a church. He talked about his church and how he was sharing the gospel. There's another generation. He stopped there. So after the meeting, I went up to him and I said, listen, do you have any kids? He said, yes, I do. I said, what are they doing? He said, well, my, my oldest son just graduated from high school and he's going off to Bible college to be a preacher. That's three generations right there because an elderly couple in the community was sensitive, sensitive enough to God that they said, God, we want to take these little boys to church and look at the impact for the kingdom of God that they probably don't even know about because of their faithfulness to God. You see, friends, the word of God says, uh, and this is in our children's area, this, this is so cool. This, if you go down to the children's check-in, you'll see this. But in our children's check-in area, this is hanging on the wall. It says, teach his word. It's Psalm 78, verses 5 through 6. Teach his word to your children so the next generation will know it, even the children yet to be born. And they, in turn, would tell their children. Isn't that incredible? And that's what's going on with many people because of the faithfulness that they have for God. I want to close this morning with this challenge. And as we think about maybe which chair we're living in and where God wants us to be, because we know God wants to move all of us, doesn't he? To closer to him, living for him. But there's been a lot of talk about the queen lately, but I want to talk about another queen, Queen Victoria. Queen Victoria... Uh, back in the 19th century, she just wanted to go out and she just wanted to get to know her people. But she didn't want her people to recognize who she was. So she just went out in everyday garb, everyday clothing, and it started to rain. So she knocked on this uh, cottage door and a lady came to the door and she said, ma'am, of course the lady didn't recognize it was a queen, but she said, it's raining, I need an umbrella. Would you loan me an umbrella? And the lady said, just a minute. She went and opened up the closet door, and there was a really nice umbrella. But she thought to herself, she'll never bring it back. She, the other umbrella was dilapidated, was old, torn, ragged. She said, I'll give her this one. So she handed the queen, again, she didn't know it was the queen, handed her the umbrella, and she thanked her and went on her way. A couple days later, she was out in front of her cottage, working in the flowers and just enjoying a nice day when she heard a noise and she looked back and she noticed, she said, oh my, this is royalty. What's going on here? And a gentleman walked up to her with the umbrella that she had loaned the queen. And he said, ma'am, you loaned the queen this umbrella the other day. She wanted me to thank you and she wanted me to return it. And the lady took the umbrella she walked inside, and she opened up that closet door and looked at that brand new umbrella. She thought, oh my, if I'd only known it was the queen, I would have given her my best umbrella. 
Friends, when we get before the Lord, when we see heaven for all that it is and how awesome and incredible God is and that Jesus Christ really is our Savior and Lord and that God is real, we do not want to get before him and go, oh my, if I'd have only known it was this great, if I'd have only known God was this awesome, I would have given him my best. Today, let's take the challenge upon us. Let's take the word of God and let's allow, ask God's Holy Spirit to fill us so that even though we're full of faults, even though we still sin, even though we come short, to say, God, would you please forgive me? Would you please help me, God, to live as closely to you in chair number one that I can, that my life, God, with all the flaws I have, with all the problems that I'm going through, that you would even use me, God, to influence others, even generations, to live their lives for God and to, that God would receive all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. Friends, this morning, I don't know if you've ever made a decision for Jesus Christ, if you've ever been baptized into Christ, but today, God is saying, do it now. The Bible says now is the time of salvation. Today is the day to make that most important decision. In fact, God says that he writes our names in the Lamb's book of life when we make that most important decision. Or maybe you've just gotten away from God and you've gotten into this second chair. You faded off. You've been in compromise. God says today you can rededicate your life to him and come back to him and live closely to him. Whatever it is, we know that God wants us reading his word sharing his love, his truth, his forgiveness with the world, that everybody, that we would be urgent, that we would be relentless, and that everyone around us, we would pray for them and really do all that we can to see that they too come into a saving knowledge of our Savior and Lord, Jesus Christ. Think about how this community would change. Think about how this state would change, how our nation would change, how our world would change. Let's live with great urgency and know that we're not promised another day, but to live for God so that no one would perish and know the destruction of hell, but everybody would know the presence of God and heaven forever and ever. Let's pray this morning. God, we thank you so much. We thank you, God, for your word. We thank you, God, for Jesus who died on the cross for our sins and who rose, God, on the third day and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. We thank you, God, for your great love that you love every person in this world and you want every person to respond to your mercy and grace and to receive Jesus Christ into their life. Ask for forgiveness for their sins. Have the Holy Spirit in their life, their name written in the Lamb's book of life and live with you forever. God, I pray if there's one here today who doesn't know you, I pray they wouldn't leave here, God without making that most important decision. And then, God, I pray for the rest of us that you would help us. God, forgive us for when we fail you, but fill us, God, with your spirit so that we would live for you and that you would receive honor and glory from our lives. For we ask it all in Jesus' name, amen. As we stand together and the worship band plays, if you wanna pray about anything, make a decision for Christ, uh, whatever the need is in your life, we have a prayer room to your right. We would love to have that opportunity uh, to, to talk with you, to pray with you. But don't let this opportunity pass you by. We don't know if we'll ever get the opportunity again. Let's stand together.